I wanted to just talk today a little bit about Israel's Independence Day. This is going to be the 73rd Independence Day celebration coming in May on May 14th of Israel becoming a nation. It's very interesting that they're celebrating 73 years because Queen Elizabeth II was married to Prince Philip for 73 years. So as long as Israel has been a nation, Queen Elizabeth II has been married to Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Having a 73 year long marriage is very interesting because I mean you literally become like one person and to have one member die is like losing part of your own soul. So I can't imagine the pain that Queen Elizabeth II is in. I just wanted to talk about that the number 73 when I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance it means gathering. So if you consider that Messiah Yeshua is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he's the royal lineage of King David that makes him a royal majestic king the greatest of all and of course Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip Duke of Edinburgh their marriage being the same length of time as Israel being a nation and that being a marriage now that Prince Philip has passed on what I'm trying to say is basically you know the church is going to be taken up as the bride of Christ so we know that we're getting to the point of the time of Jacob's trouble which is going to begin any time we don't really know exactly when but all the signs are there that that's coming but it's interesting that this marriage lasted exactly up until this point I mean that's an entire lifetime of being with one person in a marriage and it's interesting that Jesus is the bridegroom coming to take the bride and you know the time of Jacob's trouble is about to happen so is our marriage to the Messiah about to take place because this has happened in the 73 years is so significant the number 73 in Strong's Concordance is the phonetic spelling is Agwan which is A-G with a slash over the O-N and its meaning is a gathering contest struggle you know it kind of says to me in a way that the Messiah is going to take his bride and it's going to leave Israel in this time of Jacob's trouble in this final struggle for the redemption of the nation of Israel. It goes on to say about the number 73 that Agwan, a masculine noun and the root of the English words agony and agonize properly a contest or struggle, a grueling conflict, fight, figuratively positive struggle that goes with fighting the good fight of faith. And it gives 1 Timothy 6.12, which literally states struggle, the good struggle of the life of faith. It also refers to a contest hence a struggle in the soul. It's kind of interesting because it says in the ancient world athletic contests could be so severe that they caused the toughest men to crumble. And we all know that the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be a time of great testing of faith and it's going to cause the strongest men to crumble. It's going to be a very difficult time of conflict and fighting so I think it's very interesting that the word dealing with the number 73 
pertains to both gathering and then a struggle for one's faith and a time of conflict. So we know that the Bride of Christ is going to be with the Messiah in the glory cloud because he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead and Messiah will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them, with the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, another very interesting thing is that the death of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, puts the Queen in a position of possibly abdicating or stepping down, you know, from her throne to give it to the next successor, which would be her son, Prince Charles. Personally, I cannot even imagine living 73 years with another person and then suddenly having them missing out of your life. So I have a lot of sympathy and compassion for Queen Elizabeth II going through this time of separation. It's going to be extremely hard for her. And just imagine how that person is your best confidant the person that you trust the most, that you can only tell your greatest secrets to and share the most intimate thoughts with, is now not in her life. And I'm sure that it's very hard to have other people that she can trust as much as she did her husband. So I just feel very um, sad for her. Now there's something I want to tell you about Revelation 21, and if you've never heard this, it's quite a stunning statement. And this is talking about a new heaven and new earth. And there's a statement down here in Revelation 21, 24. It talks about the new Jerusalem, and I'm going to read a little bit above that. And I'll start in verse 9 of Revelation 21. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man. Interesting. The 144 cubits, how does that connect to the 144,000? Well, it just so happens that is the measurement up there on the Temple Mount. And, let's see, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. 
and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like into clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophrasis, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And now this is the verse I want you to hear. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So they're going to bring their splendor, their majesty of the royalty into the new Jerusalem, into the kingdom of God. Have you ever thought about that before? That the kings and queens of the earth are going to bring all of the majesty that they have and possess into God's kingdom, those that are saved. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So anything dealing with the royalty or the majesty or the splendor in any of the nations, I would say, you know, there's different cultures that have different traditions, and I would think that anything artistic or anything that God put into different nations that is their specialty that brings splendor and honor and glory to God would also go into it, and that is what that would mean. You know, God equipped Bezalel, who crafted all of the things that Moses showed him that replicated God's holy temple and everything in it. He was given a gift by God to be a master craftsman and jeweler, and he could do all kinds of stunning detail and artistic um, hand-wrought works. So he was very gifted and skilled at setting gemstones and all kinds of working with precious metals like gold and shaping it into the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Menorah and all kinds of skill. So anything of the nations that shows this kind of artistic skill would be brought into God's kingdom. That is to say, as long as it was to bring honor and glory to God and not some uh, artwork or anything dealing with Satan or his demons, that would not be there at all. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in the UK, you know, and in a lot of the European countries, but in England and Scotland, for example, Scotland has its crown jewels of the royalty and majesty of the kingship in Edinburgh Castle. So the Queen also has the crown jewels. So anything that would bring splendor into God's kingdom like that would probably be transferred into the kingdom of 
Messiah Yeshua, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, to ultimately bring him honor and glory. In looking over the pictures of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh's childhood, photographs and all, he surprisingly was pictured as one of the three wise men or the three kings in his school nativity play in 1938 where he was seen kneeling laying a crown before the manger of Jesus Christ and I think it's kind of funny because he was also seen with bows and arrows of Robin Hood <laughs> with his friends as well and then of course he became the husband of the Queen the Duke here is the picture of Prince Philip kneeling over here Let's see right here by the manger putting the crown by Jesus manger in 1938 I thought that was extraordinary. And that picture is posted by the Daily Mail. Of course, they were married in 1947, but Queen Elizabeth II became queen upon the death of her father, George VI, in 1952. And you know, my mother was always fascinated with the royal family. It was part of her experience to watch the coronation of the Queen in 1952 and very interesting just seeing the majesty of the royalty. One of the positive things about Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, is the stability that they brought to the region, to those countries, and for just decades on end being a steadfast stable force and you know that's really to be commended but one of the things that you may be surprised about is that they considered themselves to be dedicated Christians and of course Queen Elizabeth gives her Christmas address every year. Her Christmas address is always, you know, uh, very beautiful talking about Jesus. And I was really impressed with what she said because, you know, she gave all honor and glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, and worldwide getting that message around. And there is a lot of negative, hateful talk about the royal family, which a lot of it is just absurd. Now, with the death of Prince Philip, it's, you know, a possibility that the Queen could step down from her role, but it's very unlikely, and the reason why is very interesting. And this was reported in The Guardian where it said, Speculation about Philip's death precipitating an abdication is unlikely to bear out, say royal experts. One main reason why the queen will absolutely not abdicate is unlike other European monarchs. She is an anointed queen. The royal historian Hugo Vickers told the Guardian, referring to the pact she made with God during her coronation, and if you are an anointed queen, you do not abdicate. So not only has the royal family proclaimed Jesus Christ as the Messiah during the Christmas season, when everyone around the world is celebrating the birth of Messiah, that we know it's not really his true birth date, but it's a celebration of him. But if you go back to find out the Queen's oath that she took during her coronation, this is the coronation oath, and it says, 
The things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. Now this is very interesting. In the coronation ceremony of June 2nd, 1953, one of the highlights was when the Queen made her coronation oath taken from the order of service for the coronation. The Queen having returned to her chair, Her Majesty having already on Tuesday, the fourth day of November 1952, in the presence of two Houses of Parliament, made and signed the declaration prescribed by Act of Parliament. The Archbishop standing before her shall administer the coronation oath first asking the Queen, Madam, is your Majesty willing to take the oath? And the Queen answered, I am willing. The Archbishop shall minister these questions, and the Queen, having a book in her hands, shall answer each question severally as follows. Archbishop, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, and of your possessions and the other territories to any of them belonging or pertaining according to their respective laws and customs? Queen, I solemnly promise to do so. Archbishop, will you to your power cause law, injustice, and mercy to be executed in all your judgments? Queen, I will. Archbishop, Will you to the utmost of your power maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you to the utmost of your power maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law? Will you maintain and preserve inviolably the settlement of the Church of England and the doctrine, worship, discipline, and government thereof as by law established in England? And will you preserve unto the bishops and clergy of England and to the churches there committed to their charge all such rights and privileges as by law do or shall appertain to them or any of them? Queen, all this I promise to do. Then the queen, arising out of her chair, supported as before the sword of state, being carried before her, shall go to the altar and make her solemn oath in the sight of all the people to observe the premises, laying her right hand upon the holy gospel in the great Bible, which was before carried in the procession and is now brought from the altar by the archbishop and tendered to her as she kneels upon the steps and saying these words, The things which I have here before promised I will perform and keep, so help me God. Then the queen shall kiss the book and sign the oath. The queen, having thus taken her oath, shall return again to her chair, and the Bible shall be delivered to the dean of Westminster. In this is from the royal website royal.uk so she swore an oath to God to uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ and this is something extraordinary and of course when I read you in the book of Revelation that they the kings of the earth will bring their majesty in it those that are saved will obviously she saved because she believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so did her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. So is it any wonder that their family has been attacked with all kinds of hateful, satanic, demonic statements that were falsehoods? My book, The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel, is being published not only in the USA but in England. So my book is published in England, it's published in Australia, and I really would like the Queen to read this book because it's extraordinary and one of the things I tried to do when I designed the cover of the book was to put as much majesty and royal honor and glory into the design of my book, into the interior, 
and the exterior. I designed all of that and tried to bring the most royal majesty to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that I possibly could. The reason being that I wanted only the best for my King and I wanted to present the best to the world of His glory, honor, and majesty before all people. And I wanted to share the honor and glory and majesty of our Savior Jesus Christ, Yeshua, to the world so that they could understand how majestic that our King really is. Now, if you've seen all the gilded carriages and the incredible crown jewels, just multiply that by millions and you will be astounded by the majesty of it all and just the glimmering beauty that this king is. Now, Prince Philip's mother was Princess Alice of Battenberg, and her name was actually Victoria Alice Elizabeth Julia Marie. She was born February 25th, 1885, and died December 5th, 1969. And she was the mother of Prince Philip and mother-in-law of Queen Elizabeth II. And what's interesting about her is that she wound up being buried in Jerusalem. It says, a great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, she was born in Windsor Castle and grew up in the United Kingdom, the German Empire, and the Mediterranean. A Hessian princess by birth, she was a member of the Battenberg family, a morganatic branch of the House of Hesse Darmstadt. She was congenitally deaf. After marrying Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark in 1903, she adopted the style of her husband becoming Princess Andrew of Greece and Denmark. She lived in Greece until the exile of most of the Greek royal family in 1917. On returning to Greece a few years later, her husband was blamed in part for the country's defeat in the Greco-Turkish War from 1919 until 1922, and the family was once again forced into exile until the restoration of the Greek monarchy in 1935. In 1930, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and committed to a sanatorium in Switzerland. It probably wasn't true. Thereafter, she lived separately from her husband. After her recovery, she devoted most of her remaining years to charity work in Greece. She stayed in Athens during the Second World War, sheltering Jewish refugees for which she is recognized as righteous among the nations by Israel's Holocaust Memorial Institution, Yad Vashem. After the war, she stayed in Greece and founded a Greek Orthodox nursing order of nuns known as the Christian Sisterhood of Martha and Mary. After the fall of King Constantine II of Greece and the imposition of military rule in Greece in 1967, she was invited by her son and daughter-in-law to live at Buckingham Palace in London where she died two years later. In 1988, her remains were transferred from a vault in her birthplace, Windsor Castle, to the Church of Mary Magdalene in the Russian Orthodox convent of the same name on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And of course, her son was Prince Philip of Greece. And, you know, he was a very handsome young man. I can see why the queen was attracted to him. He was... Um, you know, had beautiful blonde hair and just very um, chisel-looking features.
blue eyes, and um, just a handsome guy, you know. And he performed in plays, and of course later became a naval officer. And it's just very interesting that he was, he considered himself to be a devout Christian along with Queen Elizabeth II. And of course, I don't know if you remember that Prince William actually went to Jerusalem to visit her grave, um, Princess Alice. Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, was married to Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark, and it says that he was the seventh child and fourth son of King George I of Greece and Olga Konstantinova of Russia. He was a grandson of Christian IX of Denmark and father of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. He was from birth a prince of both Denmark and Greece by virtue of his patrilineal descent. And he was buried at the Royal Cemetery in Athens, Greece, and that was the estate of the former Greek royal family. Now that's interesting because what happened six days before Passover when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Let me read this account in John 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served. Okay, so now I'm going to skip down here because I got to get to the triumphal entry. So it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on a donkey's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. So they came up to worship the Lord at the Feast of Passover, and these were Greeks. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And interesting that Prince Philip was also a Philip. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man and serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 
This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Messiah abideth forever, and how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness comes upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things Things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So what happened is now this testimony was going to the Greeks who were there for the Passover, who were also waving palm branches because in the end God was going to draw all mankind to himself and spread the gospel all over the world. And here we have the royal majesty of the Queen of England and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, giving the Christmas message of Jesus every year and giving an oath to God that they would uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus words came to pass and it thundered and the voice happened that God was going to bring glory to himself through his testimony. How incredible. And now you know why they're constantly being bombarded with attacks and Islam has tried to curse them. But it's not going to work because the glory of God and the majesty and honor of the kings and queens of this earth will go into the new Jerusalem. And as I've shown you the glory and honor of the kings and queens of this earth that are saved will go into the new Jerusalem to bring honor and glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords. God bless you. God bless Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, with whom we humbly give our condolences of compassion and love. On page 14, I show one snare drum. Please read the royal testimony, a great testimony that the Lord gave me in this book, The Almond Tree Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel printed in England. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for your loving, kind support of my channel and my work. Love to all.